Hey everyone, welcome. Today we're working on the graph questions from the Need Code Roadmap. So graph questions at a high level are quite similar to tree questions. Instead of working on a tree, now we're working on graphs. In Need Code questions, graphs are usually represented with either 2D matrices, like in the first few questions here, or they can also be represented by complex nodes that are connected by a series of edges. So we can represent nodes with its own object or with adjacency lists. So common algorithms that graph questions test us on include depth first search and breadth first search. Depth first search is searching the entirety of a graph, whereas breadth first search is searching the graph one layer at a time. So depending on what the question is asking, we can choose the algorithm and use it on that graph. So starting off with the first question, number of islands. So number of islands, we're given an M by N 2D binary grid, which represents a map of ones, which is land and zeros, which is water. So we want to return the number of islands there are. And an island is surrounded by water and is formed by connecting adjacent lands horizontally or vertically. So looking at the grid here, for example, here we have one island because the series of ones here are all connected. So they form one island in total. So the number of islands is one. So looking at example two here, the output is three. There's three islands, one in the top left corner one here and one in the bottom right corner. So these are three islands because islands have to be horizontally or vertically connected. They can't be connected diagonally. So these three sets of ones, they count as three different islands. So to solve this question, we can run a DFS approach, running DFS from every single cell in this grid and checking all of its neighbors. So if a cell is one or it's land, we're going to change that to be water instead of land or be something else to indicate that we've counted this piece of land. And then we're going to count every piece of land that's connected to it, forming the island. So essentially, from a single piece of land, we can register the entire island as being searched. So after searching this island, we don't want to count this as an island anymore as we move on to future cells that we count DFS on. So to use to code this up, we can first create our DFS function. So define DFS. So on DFS, we're going to pass in the parameters a grid and the row and column that we're searching. So after we search a certain cell, we don't want to be searching the cell anymore in future cases. So we want to remove it from being a piece of land. So to indicate it's not a land anymore, we can just say grid R C. So at the row at column, this is equal to a special character. We're going to use underscore here. You can use any character that you want. So this is just to differentiate this piece as not being land, not being water, but as being a piece of land that has been searched. So after setting this grid RC to be underscore, we can check all of its neighbors. So to check all of its neighbors, we need to create a directions. So directions equals to the change in rows and columns that we want to search. So for example, we want to move back one row. We're going to do one comma zero. We're going to move down one row, then going to be one zero. Or moving left is 0, negative 1. Moving right is 0, comma 1. So this is the change in row and change in column that we want to check the top, bottom, left, and right neighbors. So for dr, dc in directions, so the change in row, change in column, we want to add that to our current row and current column. So dr plus equals to r, dc plus equals to c. So this gets us our next row and next column that we want to search. So we want to check that dr and dc, the next row and next column, are actually in bounds for this array. So if 0 is less than equal to dr is less than len grid, and 0 is less than equal to dc less than equal less than len grid 0, so this is the column is less than the length of a single row. And we also want to check that the next thing we're searching with DFS is a one or a piece of land. So and also grid dr dc equals to a one. So if all of those are satisfied, then we want to call DFS with the modified grid. Remember, we modified grid at rc to be underscore. So modified grid dr and dc. So we're passing these parameters and to search all of its neighbors. So now we can call this DFS function to count the number of islands there are, because whenever we count an island, we're going to flatten it out and change every one in this island to be an underscore to make sure the island is not counted again. 
So let's create our answer variable. Let's call it islands equals to zero. Now we're going to search DFS on every single cell of the grid, like we said before. So for i in range land grid, for j in range land grid at zero, we're going to call our DFS function, but we only, we only want to call it if this is a piece of land. So if grid i j equals to a one here, that means it's a piece of land and we want to increase the number of islands by one because we found an island here. Now we want to flatten this island out and make these not pieces of land so we don't count it in the future. So we call DFS on grid and I and J. After that, we can just return the number of islands or just return islands. Let's try running it. Nice. So this question is a very common depth research question on a graph. We're going to see this DFS pattern with directions and checking all of its neighbors in future questions very similar to this one. So this question, essentially, we're searching. Let's go back to the description here. We're searching every single cell. If it's a 1, that means we increase the number of islands by 1. And then we remove all of the adjacent ones to be underscores in this case, so they're not counted because it's still a part of the previous island. And if it's not part of the previous island, for example, this one here, then we're going to increase the number of islands by one, change this to be an underscore, and then move on. So this question is a pretty common and pretty standard number of uh, depth for search question on graphs. So moving on to the next question, clone graph. So in clone graph, we're given a reference of a node in a connected, undirected graph. So we want to return a deep copy or a clone of the graph, and each node in the graph contains a value int and a list of neighbor nodes. So we have the definition of a class node here. So essentially this question, there was a similar question in the linked list section where we have to clone a linked list. It's mostly the same idea where we make a deep copy of the linked list, now we're making a deep copy of the graph. So we're given one or the entry node to the linked list, now we're given the entry node to the graph. So this question, like the linked list question, the solution is very similar. We want to create a DFS. That DFS is going to look at the node we're currently at. If we've created a new node or a deep copy of this node, we're just going to use that new node. If we haven't yet, then we're going to create a deep copy of that node and then create a deep copy of all of its neighbors. And we start by calling DFS on the entry node, which is given by the question here as a node parameter. So to code it up, we're going to need a node map. So equals to a dictionary. What this does it is that it maps old nodes to new nodes. Old nodes are nodes that are pre-existing, and new nodes are nodes in our deep copy that we want to create. So let's create our function DFS, define DFS. And what this takes in is a instance of the old node. So we're given the old node, now we want to create and return the new node. So first of all, if the old node is none, old node equals to none, we want to return none just so we don't get any null pointer exceptions. So otherwise, if old node in node map, so if it's in the node map, that means we've already created this node, so we don't want to be creating it again. So if it's in the new old node map, we just want to return it. So return node map with the index of node of old node. So after that, we want to actually create the new node because we know that we haven't created it yet. So new node equals to a node, and we can create it with a parameter value. So the value is just going to be the value of the old node because we want it to be the same. So old node dot l. So after that, we're going to want to put it in our map to indicate that we've created this. So node map at old node. So we want to map the old node to the new node equals to new node. So now we created the node. We also want to create a deep copy of all of its neighbors. So for neighbor, let's call that nay in old node dot neighbors. So for all of its neighbors, we're going to create a matching one for the new node. So new node, new node 
dot neighbor dot append append as in add to the list and we want to append a DFS on the neighbor so DFS remember DFS is going to either return it if it's already created or create a new node if it hasn't been created yet so this recursively calls the DFS function to create every single node in the graph that's reachable so after all of this we can just return the new node because the DFS function takes in the old node and returns the new node after initializing the new node with a value and creating a deep copy of all of its neighbors. So after that, what are we calling? We're calling DFS on our old node. So we can return DFS old node. Oh, it's not old node, it's just the node because that's the input to the question. So we're returning the new version of this old node. Nice, that worked. So let's try submitting it. So this question, like I said before, it's pretty similar to the linked list copy question. We're taking advantage of a map here. So this map is able to indicate whether we've created a copy of this old node before or we still need to create a copy. So based on that, we decide what we do. And if it's already created, we return it. Otherwise, we create a new one and then recursively create all of its neighbors. So that's this question. Let's move on to the next question. Max area of island. So max area of island, we're given a M by N binary matrix grid. So an island is a group of ones, just like the first question. We want to create a four directionally connected horizontal or vertical. So islands, just like the previous question, they have to be horizontally or vertically connected. Diagonals don't count. So we can assume all four edges of the grid are surrounded by water, and we want to find the maximum area of an island in grid. So if there's no island, then we want to return zero. So there's a really big example here. We have a bunch of islands here. The output is six because that's the area of the largest island. It's the one in dark orange. There's a bunch of other ones, but the max area of the other ones is five. So max area of island is gonna be six. So this question is super similar to the very first question. Instead of counting the number of islands, we're just looking at each island and seeing how big it is. So instead of having DFS return nothing except to flatten out the island, we now we wanna have DFS return the size of the island. So let's start off by cre first creating the directions. So directions equals to negative one zero this is used to find all of the uh, cells neighbors so one zero moving up a row zero negative one moving left and zero one moving right so now let's create our dfs to find dfs dfs is going to take in grid as a parameter as well as the row and column that we're on so now we want to remember we want to re return the size of the island so when we're searching, we know that this is spelled wrong. When we're searching, we know that this current cell is a one. So the size is at least one. And now we also want to flatten this. So grid r at r at column is going to equal to an underscore, just so we don't search this piece of land again, because otherwise that's going to lead to an infinitely large island. So now for every neighbor, we want to check if that neighbor is also a one. If it is, we're going to return the size. We're going to add the size of that neighbor's island to our current island because it's connected. So for dr, dc, the change in row, the change in column, in directions, we're going to do dr plus r to add it to our current row, dc plus c to add it to our current column. Now, just like the previous question, we're going to check if dr and dc are in bounds. So for uh, if zero is less than equal to dr is less than len grid and zero is less than equal to dc less than len grid zero and grid dr dc equals two so this question we're passing in zeros and ones as integers the previous question passed them in as characters so we don't need to do the string notation around this so if grid drdc at the new row at the new column is a one, what we want to do is add that to our size. So we add the size of the next island that we search onto our current size. So size plus equals to DFS on grid drdc. So on the new row and on the new column. 
After we search all of its four neighbors, what we can do is return the size. So now we want to find, we can find the area of a single island. We want to find the maximum area of all the islands. So we don't know where the islands are, so we're going to have to search the entire grid. So let's create our answer first. Let's set that to zero. So for i in range land grid, we're going to have to traverse the entire grid to look for all the islands. So for j in range land grid zero, if grid at i at j equals to one, remember we only want to check if it's an island, if it's one, otherwise it's just water, so there's no max area from that. So if it's one size equals to dfs on grid at i at j. And we want to compare this size with our answer, because if size is greater than answer, we want to set the answer to that. So ants equals to max ants size. So now we've searched every possible cell in the entire grid. We know for sure we found the maximum island, and we can just return that. So return ants. Let's run that. So this question is very similar to the very first question, where instead of looking for the number of islands, now we're looking for the island with the maximum area. So we had to modify DFS accordingly to now also return the size of the island that we're DFSing, and not just only flatten out the island. So moving on to the next question, Pacific Atlantic water flow. So in this question, we're given an M by N rectangular island that borders both the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. So the Pacific Ocean touches the island's top and left edges. The Atlantic Ocean touches the island's right and bottom edges. So looking at a diagram here, the top left of the grid touches the Pacific, the bottom right touches the Atlantic. Let's make this a bit smaller. So the island is partitioned into a grid of square cells. We're given m by n integer matrix of heights. So heights RC represents the height above sea level of a certain cell. So the island receives a lot of rain, and the rainwater can flow into neighboring cells that are north, south, east, and west, so basically top, left, bottom, and right, if the neighboring cell's height is less than or equal to the current cell's height. So for example, this four here, it can flow into all of its neighbors, but this two, it can't flow bottom or it can't flow right, it can only flow into the Pacific or to its left. So water can flow from any adjacent cell into an ocean, that is any cell adjacent to an ocean into the ocean. So any cell that is touching the Pacific can flow into the Pacific, and any cell that is touching the Atlantic can flow into the Atlantic. So now we want to return a 2D list of grid coordinates where a result IRC denotes the rainwater that can flow from cell RC. So basically we want to return a 2D list of coordinates of all the cells that can flow into both the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. We need to have cells that can flow into both. So looking at this diagram here, all the ones in the tan sand color are cells that can flow into both. So the seven, it can go down directly to Atlantic. It can go left all the way to the Pacific. Notice that these quarter fives, they're already touching the Pacific and the Atlantic. So these cells are always going to be able to flow into both. So how should we use a graph algorithm to determine the cells that can flow into both the Pacific and the Atlantic? So in this question, we can do a DFS approach, but instead of starting from the cells, we're not sure whether the cell can actually reach the Pacific or Atlantic, and we need to do a complex pathing for the cells. So instead, we can do DFS starting from the cells that are already touching the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. So the 1, 2, 2, 3, 5, these are guaranteed to be able to touch the Pacific. So we should do a DFS on all of their neighbors that are greater than or equal to in height. That means water from the 3, it would have flowed into the two and then into the Pacific. So we're going to do that in reverse. Now we're looking for neighbors that are taller or equal to in height. So anything that is greater than or equal to two, for example, these two threes, I'm gonna say this cell is now able to flow into the Pacific. We can do that on all of the cells that are already touching the Pacific and Atlantic oceans, and then look for cells that are able to reach both the Pacific and the Atlantic. So putting that into code, we can first create two sets. So one set for the Pacific, these are cells that can touch the Pacific Ocean. So this is a set and Atlantic equals another set. So Pacific, the set of Pacific represents the, all the cells that can touch the Pacific Ocean. Atlantic represents all the ones that can reach the Atlantic Ocean. So now we wanna do a depth research starting from all the cells that are already touching the Pacific Ocean. So let's create DFS. Before DFS, we need to create the directions. Directions just like before, it's going to be negative one, zero, 
one zero zero negative one and zero one to represent the north south east and west so now let's define dfs dfs is going to take in our grid it doesn't need to take in our heights because we're never modifying that so we need to take in the row we're at the column we're at and also which ocean we want to flow into so either the pacific or the atlantic let's call this variable ocean so if the row and column is already in the ocean so we're going to create a tuple of rc so if this already in the ocean we don't want to do anything else because we've already searched it so we just want to return from our function note that we have to have rc as a tuple instead of a list because we're putting that into a set and a list is not hashable in python we need to have it be a unmutable tuple that's why we're using this bracket notation here instead of the square brackets so now after we checked if rc is already in the ocean now we want to add it to the ocean because we know that this row and column is able to reach the ocean so ocean.add, we add it to the set, add a tuple, r comma c. So now we also want to check all of its neighbors. So we want to check the neighbors that are taller than this. So for dr, dc, just like before, the change in row, change in column, in directions. So dr plus equals dr, so add it to our current row, add it to our current column. So if 0 is less than equal to dr is less than n, it's called len height. And 0 is less than equal to dc, less than len height 0. And also, this neighbor has to be taller than or equal to in height. So height and height dr, dc, the new row, new column, is greater than or equal to our current height. Let's create a variable here, height equals to height at r at c is greater than or equal to height. So if the neighbor is greater than or equal to our current height and it's also in bounds, we want to do a DFS on that. So DFS dr dc ocean. And after that, we would have this DFS function would have populated all the cells that are reachable from the Pacific or the Atlantic. So now we need to determine where we want to start calling them. And we want to start calling DFS with Pacific on the top row and the leftmost column. So let's do that, DFS from Pacific. From the Pacific, we're doing the first, the topmost row. So 4J and range land heights zero. So this is for all the columns. We want to do a DFS on first the row is zero the column is going to be j and we're going to put that into the pacific ocean P -I -C -I. pacific so now we want to do the leftmost column so for i in range land heights dfs i spelled this wrong dfs i zero and pacific so now we're doing the same thing, but for the Atlantic Ocean. So we're doing the rightmost column and the bottommost row. So DFS from Atlantic for J in range plan heights zero. We're going to DFS. This is going to be the bottommost row. So DFS on land heights minus one J into the Atlantic. And for i in range land heights, this is the rightmost column here. We're going to DFS with len, not with len, but with i, len heights 0, minus 1 on the Atlantic Ocean. So Atlantic. So now we've populated these two sets with our DFS function. We have all the, ocean, all the cells that can go into the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. So this question wants us to return the cells that can flow both into the Pacific and the Atlantic. So we need the intersection of these two cells, sorry, these two sets. So in Python, we can get the intersection by calling the intersection function. So Pacific dot intersection Atlantic. So this returns a set of their intersections. So let's call that both. So cells that can flow into both are the intersection of the Pacific and the Atlantic, and we want to return both 
but we want to cast the set into a list because the question wants a list. So return list of both. Let's try running that. Cool. So this question is a little bit different to the previous question, but still uses our fundamental DFS algorithm. Now, instead of DFSing from a single starting point, now we're DFSing from all the rows and all the columns that are adjacent to the oceans. And then checking to see which cells can actually flow into the Pacific and which cells can flow into the Atlantic. Then we take the intersection of these two cells, these two sets, that's going to be the set of cells that can flow into both oceans, and we're going to return that as a list. So moving on to the next question, surrounded regions. So in this question, we're given an M by N matrix board. This board contains X's and O's and capture all regions that are four directionally surrounded by X's. So here we have an example. We want to flip all the O's that are four directionally adjacent surrounded by X's. So these three O's here in the middle they're completely surrounded by X's on all four sides. So we're going to flip them and then change them to be X's. This O here, this is not four directionally captured by X's because it's touching the bottom border. This is not an X. So this O will remain an O. So this question is a bit similar to the Pacific Atlantic water flow, as in we want to check to see which O's are the ones that are actually touching the border. The ones that are touching the border are the ones that we don't want to flip. So a trick we can do in this question is we do DFS from all four borders, and then we look at the O's that are touching the borders and doing a DFS on these O's. So we can change all these O's to a special character, for example, the underscore. And what underscore means is that this cell was previously an O, but because it's touching a border, we don't want to flip it to an X. Now we can take the entire list, flip the O's that are still O's and not underscores to be X's, because those O's means they are four directionally surrounded by all the X's, because we can't DFS them from the border. So finally, we take all the underscores and we cast them back into O's. So underscore is just a temporary variable, a temporary character that we want to use to indicate that this is an O, but we don't want to flip it. So in this question, we're going to use our fundamental DFS approach just like before. So let's code that up first. So first we need directions. So directions equals to negative one, zero, one, zero, neg zero, negative one, and zero, one. So now let's define DFS. So this is going to take in our board because we need to modify the board as well as the row and column that we're at. So because we're DFSing from the edges, we're going to assume we reached an O. So if it's an O, we're going to change that to an underscore. So board R C equals to an underscore. So after that, we're going to do DFS in all of its neighbors. So for DR, DC, the change in row and change in column in directions. So we're going to add that to our current row and current column. So first, let's make sure that the new row, new column are in bounds. So if zero is less than equal to dr, less than len board, and zero less than equal to dc, less than len board, zero. So it's inbound, and we only want to continue our DFS if the next cell we're searching is also an O. So and board at dr at dc equals to an O. So if this is the case, we want to continue DFSing. So DFS board, new row, new column. OK, so after that, we have our DFS function. This changes all the O's into underscores. So we want to call this DFS function from the four borders. So every cell in the border of the grid that is already an O. So for i in range len board, Let's do this first on the leftmost and rightmost columns. So if board i0, the leftmost column is a O, we want to call DFS on this. So DFS board i0. So if board i at the, the rightmost column, the rightmost column is going to be len board 0 minus 1 equals 2 and O. So if this is the case, we want to DFS on that as well. So DFS board i 
and len board 0 minus 1. So on the rightmost column. So now what we want to do is we want to do it on the topmost row and bottommost row to cover all four borders. So for j in range len board 0, so for all the columns, if board 0 j equals 2 and 0, we want a DFS on that. So DFS board 0 j. So on now that we're looking at the bottommost row, so if board should be len board minus 1 j, if this is equal to an O, we want a DFS on that. So DFS board len board minus 1 and j. So now we cast our DFS function on the topmost row, bottommost row, leftmost column, and rightmost column. So we covered all the borders. We want to change those O's to be underscored so they're not casted into X's. So now the O's that are not changed into underscores, that means they are captured, and we want to switch them into X's. So for I in range len board, for J in range len board 0, so now we're searching the entire grid if we have an O, so if board IJ. First, let's look for underscores. If we have an underscore, that means we want to switch it back to an O. Because remember, the underscore is only a temporary symbol. It means that this O should not be flipped into an X. So in the end, we want to change the underscores back to O's. So board at I at J is going to go back into an O. However, a lift board i j if this is actually an o that means we want to switch it because it's been captured since it's not an underscore so board i j equals 2 and x so this question says do not return anything we just modify the board in place so we don't have to return the board we can just call this let's run it nice so let's try submitting this so this question is pretty similar to Pacific Atlantic water flow, as in we're calling DFS from the border instead of from a cell. So with that DFS in this question, we have to do a trick where we modify the board and change all the bordering O's to be a special character, then switching them back just to make sure we don't cast those O's into X's. So moving on to the next question. So rotting oranges. In this question, we're given an m by n grid where each cell can have one of three values. So these values can be 0, which represents an empty cell. It can be 1, which represents a fresh orange. Or it can be 2, representing a rotten orange. So let's look at an example here. In this example, we have a rotten orange in the top left corner. Every other cell is either a fresh orange or an empty cell. So continuing to read the question, every minute, any fresh orange that is four directionally adjacent to a rotten orange becomes rotten. So any orange that is touching a rotten one will become orange within the next minute. So now we want to return the minimum number of minutes that must elapse until no cell has a fresh orange. So if it's, that's impossible, then we want to return negative one. So looking at example one here, we see that the orange spreads its rottenness layer by layer, so one level at a time. So at minute zero, only this orange here in the top left corner is rotten. After minute one, it spreads to its neighbors. So this at zero one, this orange at one zero, they both become rotten. So then they spread to its neighbors and then it spreads down and then it spreads right until all the oranges are rotten. So immediately we see that the oranges are spreading layer by layer, which indicates we want to use a breadth first search approach because that searches all of its neighbors first, then the next layer's neighbors, then the next layers and so on. One more thing we can notice from this example is that if any orange is not touching a rotten orange and it's not connected to that rotten orange by a path of oranges, that means that orange will never become rotten, in which case we want to return negative 1. So we want to use a breadth for search approach which takes advantage of a queue to store the oranges that are currently rotten and then we push to the end of the queue new oranges that are fresh and neighbors of rotten oranges. So let's put that into code. So first we have a BFS. This is equal to a DQ. We use a DQ in Python. And we want to store some variables like fresh. We want to count the number of fresh oranges. And when fresh becomes zero, that means we set every fresh orange to be a rotten orange and we can return the time. So we set fresh to be zero first. Then we're going to count the number of fresh oranges. 
and we also need a time variable to return as our answer. So for i in range, so let's look at the entire grid and look for rotten oranges to put into our BFS queue and fresh oranges to increment our fresh variable. So for i in range plan grid, let's traverse the entire grid for j in range plan grid at zero. So if grid i j this equals to two, that means we have a rotten orange. So we want to put that into our BFS. So BFS.append append, we can have that as a tuple i j, so the row and the column. So otherwise, if grid i j equals to one, that means we have a fresh orange. So the number of fresh oranges should increment by one. We need to keep track of the number of fresh oranges so we know when we actually finish our BFS. So now at the start, if the number of fresh equals to zero, we can just immediately return zero because it takes no time for all the oranges to become rotten. So now we're going to use a BFS approach. So let's actually create the directions first, just like before. We have the four directionally adjacent. So directions are going to be negative one, zero, one, zero, zero, negative one, and zero, one. So now, while there's still oranges in our BFS queue, which means while there's still rotten oranges that haven't spread to its neighbors yet, so while len BFS is greater than zero, we're going to pop out all of this rotten oranges and then set the neighbors of those oranges to become rotten. And then they're gonna continue the next cycle of BFS. So basically the next level. So first we need to determine how many rotten oranges there are in the current level. So that's going to be the size of the BFS. So size equals to len BFS. Now we're going to pop out all the oranges in this level, all of them are rotten. So for i in range len size, not len size, just in range size, we're going to pop out the row and the column. So this equals to bfs.pop left. We pop it from the left side because it's a FIFO queue. So for dr, dc, the change in row and change in column, just like before in directions, Let's increment the row and increment the column to be our current ones with a change of one or negative one. So if zero is less than equal to dr, less than equal to len grid, we want to make sure the new row and new column are still inside our grid. So zero less than equal to dc, less than len grid, zero. So if it's inbound and its neighbor is a fresh orange, we only want to spread the rottenness to fresh oranges. So if grid dr dc equals to one so if it's fresh then we're going to set that to be rotten so it's going to be rotten in the next cycle so we're going to set it to be rotten so grid dr dc equals to two the number of fresh oranges is going to decrease by one because that orange is no longer fresh so fresh minus equals to one and then we're going to put it in the end of the bfs queue so it can spread the rottenness to its neighbors so bfs dot append at the end of the queue, we're going to put the new row and the new column. So we are done with this BFS queue. This BFS is going to continuously spread the rottenness from the original rotten oranges all the way to the rot oranges that are four directionally adjacent. But after every cycle of, so after every level, we need to increment time by one because we're moving on to the next minute. So time plus equals to one. Now we want to check, did we clear all the oranges? So are all the oranges rotten? So if fresh equals to zero, that means all the oranges are rotten. We want to return time because we're done after a certain amount of time. So if this BFS queue doesn't set every orange to be rotten, that means there's still fresh oranges. So if fresh, that means there's still fresh oranges, in which case we want to return negative one. We don't have to check fresh anymore because we know that if fresh was zero ever, we're gonna have returned. So after that, we can just return negative one because that means there's fresh oranges that haven't been converted to rotten oranges. Let's try running that. Directions, oh, I missed the S here. Cool. So this question is a little bit different than the previous questions because we're using a BFS approach instead of a DFS approach. So we're using BFS or breath research because we wanna set the oranges to be rotten one level at a time. Because we need to see that how, 
we need to see the number of minutes it takes for all the oranges to become rotten and the oranges spread themselves to become rotten in one level at a time. So that's why we're using a BFS approach. The directions is still the same as the previous questions because all the oranges can only become rotten if they're four directionally adjacent to a rotten orange. So with that out of the way, moving on to the next question, we have islands and treasure. So this question is a premium question in leak code. So this is the neat code site, which has a free version of this question, but the question is slightly altered. But the same, the idea is still the same. Instead of walls and gates, we have islands and treasure. So now we're given an M by N 2D grid initialized with three possible values. So we have negative one, which is a water cell. We can't travel on water cells or zero, zero is a treasure chest or infinity which is a land cell that can be traversed. So we can walk on the land cells or on the treasure chest, but we can't walk on the water. And we wanna fill each land cell with the distance to its nearest treasure chest. So every cell that is previously an infinity in the grid, we wanna change that to be the distance to the nearest treasure chest. And if a land cell cannot reach the treasure chest, then the value should remain as infinity. That makes sense. So. Travel, traveling on the grid, we can only go up, down, left, or right. So this, again, is a BFS question because we're looking for the minimum distance before we're looking for the minimum time in rotten oranges. So for the minimum distance, instead of searching from every grid cell, instead we can search from every treasure chest cell. So for every cell that is initially a zero, we can do a BFS around the cell. So to populate that, to populate all of its neighbors with a distance towards it. So for example, if a cell is zero, then all of its neighboring cells will become one, except unless it's water. So if it's not water, then we can just walk towards this treasure chest cell and that has a distance of one. So we're going to do a BFS approach starting from all of the cells that are initially zero because all of those are initially treasure. So for our BFS approach, again, we're going to use a DQ. So BFS equals a DQ. And, uh, so we want to start this DQ with every cell that's zero. So let's traverse the entire grid for I in range and grid, or J in range and grid zero. So if I grid at I J equals to zero, that means we have a treasure chest and we want to start the BFS from all the treasure chests. So BFS.append we can have a tuple of row and column, I and J. So now we have a BFS queue with I, J, so all the rows and columns that are treasure chests. Now we can do a BFS. So while there's still treasure chests that we haven't finished traversing, or while there's still cells we haven't finished traversing, so while len BFS is greater than zero, what you wanna do is pop out all the cells that are in the same layer, just like before because all those are going to have the same distance to this treasure chest. So again, size equals to len BFS. So now for every treasure, sorry, for every cell in this layer, we're going to do a pop it out. So do a for loop for I in range size, the row and column, we're going to pop out from BFS from the left side, the pop left, because we're using a FIFO queue. So now we're going to set this grid r c equals to distance. So for dr, the change in row and change in column in directions, I haven't actually coded up directions. So let's create our distance. This is initially set to zero because all the treasure chests have distance zero towards a treasure chest. And directions is just like before, directions equals to negative one, zero, one, zero, zero, negative one, and zero, one. So for dr, dc in directions, we're going to add it to our current row and current column. So dr plus equals to r, dc plus equals to c. So if this is in bounds, so zero is less than equal to dr less than len grid, and zero is less than equal to dc less than len grid, so we made sure it's in bounds, and we also want to make sure the cell that we're the neighbor cell that we're going to is equal to infinity. That means we haven't searched it yet, because we don't want to do repeat searches. So if grid dr dc the new row and the new column equals to infinity, just copy this number over. 
So if it equals to this int max, then what we want to do is we want to set the distance at that cell to be distance plus one. So grid rc equals to distance plus one. After that, we can just add that to our BFS. So that new land cell is going to breadth for search for all of its neighbors. So bfs.append, going to append the new row and the new column. So after done finishing a cycle, we want to increase the distance by one because the next cycle is going to have cells that take longer to reach the treasure chest. So distance plus equals to one. Actually, this should be dr and dc for the new row and new column, and dc should be comparing to the length of the first row. So let's try running that. Nice. Let's submit it. Cool. So this question is pretty similar to the previous question, rotten oranges. Instead of searching from every rotten orange, now we're searching from every treasure to get the distance from the treasure to all of the pieces of land. So now we know that the that is the minimum distance from the land to the closest treasure. So this is part one of the neat code graph questions. We're going to do part two very soon. So thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you're able to learn something and I'll see you in the next video.